All right, did I tell you where? Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3. And Matthew chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. Matthew 3 and verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And let's pray. Lord, it is good to be here tonight, and we thank you, Lord, for uh, Sunday night church. We pray for your blessing upon uh, each and every person that's here, and that uh, hearing these words, uh, minister, Lord, to our needs. Uh, increase our faith, strengthen us, Lord, by your might, and help us as we go out in this little while, uh, go out uh, closer to thee and stronger in, in the faith and to uh, maintain that and continue to grow from there. I pray in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. Uh, now, this Resurrection Sunday night, um, we had good services this morning and uh, you know appropriate themed uh, message. Uh, tonight, I'm going to continue on with uh, where I've been going on, on previous uh, Sunday nights recently, and I'll get to back to that in a moment. But I just want to say, um, I'm glad that this world stops and remembers the resurrection of Jesus Christ, even if um, there's so much more to it than that. Uh, on this day and the date and all of that, uh, I'm glad that they're forced to think about him. Just like at Christmas time, I'm glad they're forced to think about him then. Uh, but as far as um, as far as the resurrection goes, you know, we who are saved, uh, we live in the spirit and power of the resurrection, or we're supposed to anyway, all year through, 365 days a year. And so it's good to be saved and thank God that he, he lives. Uh, but I want you to know something, um, tomorrow he's going to live too. And then uh, Tuesday when things may be getting rough, um, he's still going to be alive. And so you can keep on living in that power and spirit of the resurrection. So tonight what I'm going to do, I'm bring you a fourth message in our Sunday night uh, mini-series about uh, the subject, God is able. And as I said at the beginning of last week's message, um, I anticipate this to be the last message of this little mini-series, although last week I told you I reserved uh, the right to add another if I did not finish all the material, which I did not, and thus uh, the other message. Um, in that respect, this series is sort of reminiscent to, to me, at least, of the book of Philippians. Uh, when Paul gets to Philippians chapter 3, he starts it out by saying, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He says, finally, my brethren, at the beginning of chapter 3. And then um, uh, he goes on for uh, another uh, 21 uh, verses in chapter 3, followed by 23 more in, in chapter 4. I mean, he's only about halfway through the book when he says, finally, my brethren. And somebody said that the preacher's favorite part of the message is uh, the closing. And that's why he um, does it so much during the message. <laughs> um, you know, a preacher, when a preacher says, when some preachers are preaching and they say, um, uh, in conclusion or in closing, uh, you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I guess this may or may not be my last message on the subject tonight, although I really think that, that it will be. There's another point I could make. Um, but it's something that we've actually kind of, I feel like I've hit on uh, a number of times in, in other messages and or lessons, so uh, I'll, I'll probably stop tonight. But if so, I guess I'll outdo um, Paul's pattern. Uh, anyway, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. I love the sound and the tenor uh, of uh, those words in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Matter of fact, I, I like to read and quote just the, even the first eight words of the verse for emphasis which says, uh, in those days came John the Baptist uh, preaching. I love the sound of that. John the Baptist was a preacher. You know, there's not enough preachers around today. Uh, I'm going to make a statement, and, and I want you to understand what I'm saying. There are more pastors than there are preachers. Now, every pastor ought to be a preacher, but not every pastor is a preacher. In fact, there are some pastors who today, um, they, they, almost, um, they, they almost term the 
idea of, uh, of preacher as an offensive term. They don't want to be called a uh, preacher. Um, today, the Bible talked about a day when it, when it would come, and it has come today when men have having itching ears, they heap to themselves teachers having those itching ears. They don't want preachers. They just want somebody to teach. Now, a preacher, a pastor, a bishop, uh, and a preacher ought to be apt to teach, but uh, he also ought to be able to preach. And in our services here, the way we have it um, uh, set up, we have a Sunday morning service and a Sunday night service, and then we have a Sunday school, and we have Wednesday night, four services during the week. Half of those are preaching services. Half of those are teaching services. So uh, you need both. You need teaching and preaching. Uh, we, we don't have enough preachers around today. A preacher proclaims the truth, and he drives it home to the listeners. <laughs> um, pre preaching tends to get a little bit louder than teaching a little bit more emphatic than, uh, than teaching. Uh, it lays it on the line more than teaching. Uh, a preacher, he gets a message from God, and he preaches it to the people. A preacher, he tells it like it is, and uh, he speaks, as the Bible charged him to, as the oracles of God. In other words, he's, his idea is to be, all right, if God were here, what would he uh, tell these people? And he's to seek the face of God, get a message from God, and then go deliver it to the people. And that's what a preacher is uh, to, to endeavor to do. A preacher preaches the word of God, even though he knows that not everybody's going to like what he has to preach. And it's not that he likes preaching things that people don't like. It's just that he is called to be uh, the mouthpiece of God or to speak for God by preaching uh, his words. And John the Baptist was that kind of a man. In those days came John the Baptist uh, preaching, and that's what he did. And he's uh, there preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and he's telling those folks, he's saying, repent ye. Uh, you don't necessarily hear a lot about that today. A lot about a lot about uh, a preaching day is it's almost you know psychology or philosophy trying to get people just to feel good about themselves without making any change uh, that uh, requires repentance. But repentance is a change of heart and a change of attitude, uh, which ultimately ought to result in a change of life. And people today are, are preachers today. I, again, I, I use the term loosely, but pastors today or ministers today are trying to get people to feel good where they're at without any changing. If you didn't need any changing, I, I'm going to guess you probably would already feel good where you are. But the fact that you don't shows that there's probably some adjustment that needs to be made. And John the Baptist is preaching, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's preaching, and folks are coming out. And then uh, the religious leaders come out, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They come to his baptism. And when they come uh, to his baptism, John the Baptist saw right through them. Uh, these were the religious leaders of the day, some of them. And, uh, and they, he saw their hypocrisy. They were not right with God. He saw right through their hypocrisy, and he preached them a little message beginning in verse number 7. Look there uh, with me again. John, or Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, John the Baptist preaching. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, It's so nice to have you in church today. <laughs> well, that's not what he said. Now, I'm not against saying that, but John the Baptist just gives them what for right from the get-go. He says, O, o generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And he didn't say it like some milk sop, you know, as they'll call him Casper Milk Talk. He didn't say it like that. He didn't say, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I mean, he's preaching it. That's what he said. He came preaching. So emphatically, he's letting it go. Uh, and he says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he tells them what to do about it. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. You're coming out here like you are, you're genuine like some of these other folks are, and I know you're not changing your life. You don't show me anything different. I need to see something different out of your life. He's saying, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. They're going to claim their spiritual pedigree, tracing their roots back to Abraham, and John's not having it. He's reading their thoughts. And think not to say within yourselves, because that's what they were thinking, you can be sure. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. That's where I stopped reading. But let's read a little bit further because the message continues. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the tree. See, that's what a preacher will do. He'll, he'll lay the axe, that sharp, -edged, sharp two edged sword of the word of God, as it were, to the root of the problem and get down there where, where you can be helped. Now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, talking about Jesus, is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He's already pointing him to Jesus. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's good. And with fire. Some people think that's good. 
So that's not good. That's not the baptism you want. You take the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but you don't want the baptism of fire. Why? What's the baptism of fire? Verse 12. Who, see, see the, by the way, first of all, see the uh, punctuation mark after fire, the colon. He's going to expound and tell you what that baptism of fire is in verse 12. And talking about Jesus first, he says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. That's the good news for the wheat. But he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The baptism of fire is somebody being immersed in the lake of fire, ultimately. The unquenchable fire is the unquenchable fire of hell. And when John the Baptist is preaching, uh, he's preaching, uh, them, uh, preaching to them about getting right uh, so they don't go to hell. And uh, what you hear, what you read and see there in, John, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, uh, or 3, verses 7 through 12, when John the Baptist is preaching, that's what you see. That is preaching. You know, he told them the truth. And if you don't tell the people the truth about their condition and the truth about um, the judgment of God and their accountability to him, you don't give them an opportunity to get right with God and avoid that judgment. And John the Baptist, he gives them that opportunity, and he preaches to them about the dangers of unquenchable fire and how they need to repent and get things right uh, with God. Now, uh, that's, the, that's the full message that he lays out there at that time in this passage in Matthew chapter 3. The verse that we want to zero in on that pertains to uh, our subject matter at hand in this little mini-series is verse number 9. So let's go back there and look at verse number 9, Matthew 3, 9. And here John says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. And here's the statement, For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. God is able to raise up, raise, uh, God is able of these stones God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, taken literally, that's quite a statement. That is quite a statement. And I take it literally. I take it literally because neither John um, nor the Lord in the Spirit of God in the inspiration of this portion of Scripture uh, interjects uh, anything to tell you that it cannot or should not be taken literally. And when I think about the, this um, literal application of this, that God is able of these stones raise up children unto Abraham, and when I think about what John the Baptist says, uh, it tells me this, uh, point number one, God is able to do the miraculous. I mean, to raise up children, raise up human beings from stones, that's pretty miraculous. Um, John's, uh, John's looking around there, and, and, and he says he's able of these stones, so there's stones right around there. And he's, he's showing them. He's using them as oxen. You see these stones right here? God's able to make uh, children out of them. And be like, um, just, just to illustrate this a little further, get a good idea of it. It's like he's got these little these stones there. So you see that there? You see that there? You see that there? There's four of them. God can make four people out of those stones. God can take a stone and he can raise up a, a, a person from that stone. That's what God can do. That's pretty miraculous. And um, I don't know. I don't know how that sounds to you. If it sounds far-fetched to you or seems far-fetched, uh, if so, let's not forget that God created the first man out of dust. I've said it before, but I'll say it again tonight while we're on the subject. That is why some of the um, supplements, minerals, trace elements, that's what we take into our body, stuff that comes from the earth. Iron, zinc, our bodies need it. Why? Because that's where we came from. We came from the ground. And, and so God, God creates the first man from the dust of the ground. That's miraculous. And then he creates the first woman from the man's rib. And after he performed the first operation, cut open Adam. At first of all, put him, put him into a deep sleep, which you want to do before you cut somebody open. <laughs> Not that you want to cut somebody open unless you're a surgeon. Um, and not that you want anybody to cut you open unless they're a surgeon. But um, he does that, pulls out a rib, closes up the flesh instead thereof. So, I mean, uh, you've got the, uh, you know, God, the anesthesiologist gets there, puts him to sleep, uh, cuts open, pulls it out, stitches him back up, um, and then takes and makes the woman out of the, the rib. It's pretty miraculous stuff. And God could take, he said, of these stones and raise up children to Abraham. I'm telling you tonight uh, that God can do uh, the miraculous. Um, if, there, if there was one primary message that I wanted to get across when I started doing this, uh, this little mini-series, that was the message. Uh, I, I wanted to see your faith, uh, faith bolstered, uh, increased in believing what God is able to do. 
Uh, I want you to have, have a renewed faith and a renewed confidence and um, uh, to the point where, where you're ready to reach out and do something about it, believing that God can do the miraculous. <clears throat> There's a, a little old kid Sunday school song that goes, um, uh, if I can remember the tune, uh, God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. And how true that is. God can do anything but fail. I mean, God can do anything but fail uh, because that is in his nature and in his ability as God. He can do it all. He, um, he, he's, he's already done a whole bunch of miraculous stuff. Look, the fact that you are here alive breathing is, is a miracle. It, that, that you were in the first place is a miracle. That you still are now these many years later is another miracle. Uh, the fact that here we are um, existing on a planet that's, um, that's, that's hanging in space, floating around upon nothing is a miracle. And it's just one planet of many planets, but here we have life, and then you've got this vast universe. All you got to do is look around and see the miraculous ability of God. And God who took and, and uh, created that which is seen of things which do not appear and spoke them into existence and created them by Jesus Christ. That's, that's the miracles of God. God is able to do uh, anything. He's able. Like the other kids Sunday school, I think I mentioned earlier in the series. He's able. He's able. I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the brokenhearted. He set the captive free. Uh, he made the lame to walk again. He caused the blind to see. He is able. And he's able to carry you through. And that's what we've been talking about. There's some, some, of, the, some of these things especially speak to, to you just believing what God's able to do uh, so you can lay hold upon God and watch him do some miraculous things in your life. Started out with God is able to save. He, he's able to save you and able to save others. Have faith that he's able to do that. He's able to secure. If you're saved, you are secure. Even if you don't know it, you are secure. It's good to be saved. Um, uh, the, he's able to uh, succor. That is to, to come aside uh, alongside you and be your helper and, and give you aid in any situation. He is able to deliver thee like we just uh, uh, sung about. He's, he's able to do that. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. And another song says, He is able to deliver thee, He is able to deliver thee, a hymn uh, that we sing. And, and, and we want to believe that because sometimes folks get in situations and they don't think God can deliver them. I'm going to tell you what, if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, were in a situation like they were and they had to get cast in a burning, fiery furnace and God was able to deliver them out safely without even the smell of fire upon them, uh, God can deliver you from your situation. The difficulty that you're facing. He is able to deliver thee. God's able to make all grace abound toward you, we talked about. Whatever you need to get through, whatever you're going through, God's able to make that grace abound. He has an abundance of it, and he can give it to you. That's a great promise over there in 2 Corinthians. You know, we talked about how God is able to keep his promises, so you can lay hold on uh, some of his promises and, and cleave to them and, and, and trust him to come through for you. Uh, God is able to keep you from falling. Um, boy, if, if, by the way, if, you, if you're prone to falling literally, claim that. But, of course, we look at it more um, per, particularly in the spiritual sense. He's able to present you faultless. Uh, be, he's able to keep you from falling. And then along with that, he's able to prevent, present you faultless before the presence of his glory. God can help you to live a consistent Christian life without um, failing so often and getting a, a lot more victory than perhaps you thought you could have. And he's able to preserve you to, so he, you can be presented faultless before his presence and, and have a good report at the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, he's able to do far more above all that we think or, or, or ask and ask or think. And he, he can do far more than we could ask or even imagine, according to Ephesians chapter 3. And we saw last time God's able to restore the nation of Israel. We talked about that, as well as God's able to give you a new body. All that's good stuff. And what I'm trying to say is uh, figure it out, whatever it needs to be, uh, and, and whatever you need him to be. God can do that. God is able to do the miraculous. He's able to do that for you. He's able to do it for others. And sometimes we believe he's able to do it for others, but uh, we got to believe he's able to do it for us as well. But he is. He's able to do it for whoever. Uh, right now, uh, as a church and, and with some other folks, uh, we are praying around the clock for the Lord to do something miraculous in the life and the body of uh, April Moore and heal her up from her cancer. And, and we're getting good reports that her tumors are shrinking. Uh, tumors that actually protrude and I've seen them uh, from her, her neck so that you can actually see them coming. You can't see the tumor itself because it's underneath, but you can see the protrusion where it's where it's pushing out on the skin. 
And um, uh, even before we instituted this regimen of prayer, where, where we're reaching out by faith for God to do something miraculous, April herself was already uh, putting her faith in a miracle-working God, uh, praying uh, for the Lord to heal her up and believing that He could, and, and that He could put her in remission from the cancer and allow her the years to, rem to, 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 to remain here on this earth and raise her two remaining children at home, and then even give her time beyond that. And uh, I'm telling you what, if God can raise up um, living children from these stones, God can sure heal her up from her cancer. And he can do so much more. And so uh, let me ask you this, what miracle do you need? What miracle do you need? I'm not, I'm not talking about foolishness. You know, we can say silly things and, and you know, want this or that. And the other thing that's, that's, I'm talking about in your life spiritually, really. What miracle uh, do you need? Do you need some healing yourself? Um, the salvation of a loved one that you did you look at? Sometimes we look at people and we think, man, that, that person, they just there's no way they'll ever get saved. It might be somebody looked at you before you got saved and thought that about you. God's able to save. We talked about that. What, what is it that you need? What miracle? A victory over besetting sin that you haven't been able to kick? A bad habit of sin that you haven't been able to get out of your life? What is it that you need? Personal revival? What, what miracle do you need? Um, is there a, would you like God to allow you to, to win somebody that's lost uh, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Would you like a lost soul that you could win? Uh, God can do that for you. What, do you, what is it? Uh, you need a better understanding of the Bible? You feel like you're just struggling, you can't get a hold of it? God can help you understand the Bible. Uh, maybe you'd like to be able to memorize Scripture and think, well, I'm just, my brain's too far gone. God can renew your brain strength <laughs> and, and, and help you to memorize Scripture. Oh, what is it? What, what, what miracle do you need? An overhaul in your personality so, so you're more like Jesus? What miracle do you need? A financial miracle? A, an emotional miracle to lift you up uh, uh, out of your uh, depression? Uh, what is it that you need? Personal discipline? Uh, full surrender to God? Uh, the power to answer His call on your life? The strength to keep on going because uh, things are, are tough. Uh, the strength to stay right with God through it all. God's able to do that and, and more. God's able to do, do the miraculous. Uh, we tend to put limitations on them. I read in Psalm 78, verse 41, where the children of Israel turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They, they put a limit on what God could do uh, because they turned back. Like unto the people in the New Testament where Jesus came and the Bible says he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They limited Jesus by their unbelief and they limited him, Jesus by turning back and God by turning back and not sticking uh, by the stuff. And, and, and God could have done so much more if they just would have hung in there. Uh, we need to just give the Lord a chance. Sometimes we, we branch out and then we, we turn back before uh, we reach the finish line. Uh, we, we branch out, we start drawing nigh to God. And what does the Bible say about that? Draw nigh to God and He will what? He'll draw nigh to you. So you start getting close to God, God will start getting close to you. And we start drawing nigh to God and God starts moving closer. And then we lose faith uh, before we, we meet up in, in, in just great close fellowship. And we turn back and, and blow the whole thing. You ought not to do that. We just got to give the Lord a chance. Give Him a chance by sticking with it, by praying, by believing by seeking His face, by, by claiming His promises, and stepping out by faith. Give Him a chance. You step out by faith and watch Him. Watch Him work. Faithful, He said, you talk about His call of God. The Bible says sometimes folks don't surrender to the call of God because they're too scared to. I mean, uh, you, there's no better place for you to put your hand, your soul, your life, than, than right there uh, in God's hand. Your life in God's hands for Him to direct you. And then some folks, they're afraid to surrender. And then some folks surrender and they're afraid to step out by faith when they get an inkling of what God might want them to do. I'll tell you something. Uh, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I believe verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. If God calls you with the calling, he will also give you the enabling. Whether that's a, the big picture of his call in your life or whether uh, he, he's just calling you just to, to get a little closer to him or step out a little further uh, from the boat. Um, or step out a little deeper into the waters. God will, God will hold you up, and He'll provide the way. So, so the Lord is able to do the miraculous, and this is really going to lead right into our, our final point uh, for uh, tonight, and that's going to be in 2 Chronicles 25. So I'd like to ask you to turn there. 2 Chronicles chapter number 25.
we're not leaving this thought about the Lord being able to do the miraculous because it's going to work in conjunction uh, with this next one. But uh, let's read in 2 Chronicles 25, beginning in verse number 5. 2 Chronicles 25 and verse number 5. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, according to the house of their fathers and throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield. He hired also an 100,000 mighty men of, of valor out of Israel for 100 talents of silver. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou wilt go, do it, be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help and to cast down. And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents, of, uh, hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. That's our last point, uh, maybe our longest point, but our, but our last one. Uh, the Lord is able to give thee much more uh, than this. There are certain portions of Scripture that, um, that I can remember when I first noticed them. Uh, sometimes I, I can think of one in Isaiah that I, I, I can pick out. I, I remember where I was, and I remember who, who I was talking to, and um, then uh, pointing it out and, and remember um, uh, seeing it uh, in there. And there's certain portions of Scripture I can remember when and how I first uh, noticed them. Not necessarily when I first read them, but when I first noticed them. Because there's a lot of Scriptures that, um, although I had read them, I, I hadn't really noticed them. They hadn't jumped out and grabbed me. And uh, such is the case with this ending here in Second Chronicles chapter 25, verse 9, where it says, The Lord is able to give thee much more uh, than this. Uh, from the summer of uh, 1982 to uh, early 1983, I had the privilege of working at the Roloff Homes in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, I, was, I was before that going to um, uh, Bible school. I was at uh, Hiles Anderson College for a year. Um, prior to that, I was at uh, Fellowship Baptist College in East Peoria, Illinois. And, um, and, and I had a roommate at uh, Hiles who um, was from the programs. He actually had gone through the program at um, the homes in Corpus Christi, Texas. And, and Brother Lester Roloff was an evangelist, and he was a, a local church pastor in Corpus Christi, and he started homes for uh, troubled youth. And uh, this um, young man was in the uh, the lighthouse home, and he had been there and been in trouble and, and gone through things there and was now in, in Bible school. And he was going back to the summer uh, for the summer to work there, and I thought, man, that'd be pretty cool if I could do that. And so I wrote to um, uh, Brother Roloff and said, you know, I'm in Bible school. Uh, I'd like to see about coming out here for the summer. He wrote me back and, um, and told me that uh, he was very accepting, accepting of it, but told me he passed on the uh, letter to uh, Brother Cameron, who was his assistant. And um, uh, long story short, uh, they allowed me to come and work at the Anchor Home for Boys. And so uh, working there, the Anchor Home for Boys were for troubled youth that were uh, up to age 18, and then the lighthouse went from 18 to 25. And um, but uh, so we'd have boys that were up to 18, and right around there in that transition point, uh, they could they could still stay at the home. We had I think the youngest one we wound up had. I mean, we had younger ones that were, some of them were a single digit um, that were there, but uh, most of them you know teenagers uh, type type years. Shortly before I arrived there in the um, summer of uh, 1982. Uh, they had just completed shooting um, a movie called uh, Jubilee 50, and they would put out different movies from time to time. And this movie was in particular about the uh, the ministry. Brother Roloff was uh, he had gone through a lot, and so some of the movies were about he was fighting the state because the state were trying was trying to get him to take a license to run the homes, but he didn't want to take a state license to run the homes because then he'd have to do things how they told him to do it. And uh, he'd been in their homes and uh, for juvenile homes, and they weren't helping the kids. And he was helping the kids with a Bible curriculum and program and church and prayer and scripture and discipline. And so um, he had to fight battles in some of the movies, I think, were about that. But, but this one was about the ministries there uh, called Jubilee 50 in honor of his uh, 50th anniversary in the ministry. A number of the boys that uh, were in the home uh, when I worked there were, were in the movie. Uh, matter of fact, they, uh, they had finished filming it, but then one of the boys that they had filmed um, got in trouble, who was at the anchor home, he got in trouble 
And so they had to take him out of the film and they came and, and, and shot another shot with um, uh, one of the kids that was there um, that uh, was, was, was doing better in the home. And so they used his testimony instead. <clears throat> but um, after the film uh, was finished and went through a post-production, uh, we got to see it. <clears throat> um, during part of the film, <clears throat> uh, you've got Brother Roloff in there. I think right at the beginning, he, they have him in there at his desk uh, uh, in his office uh, speaking. He may come back at the end and do it as well. Uh, but uh, somewhere along in there, they have him speaking from his office. And uh, he made reference to the Lord speaking to him through uh, this verse right here, 2 Chronicles chapter 25, at the end, verse number 9, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Uh, and those words to him were a great encouragement. For him, it was a, a promise to claim. Um, he, it was a promise for him to claim as he carried the burden of administrating those homes. And not only keeping them, uh, not only you know seeing that the kids are helped, but but just the administration from nuts and bolts standpoint and financial standpoint, uh, it was it, it cost a lot of money to feed those people every day and to keep the uh, lights on and so forth. And uh, and and he saw that, and the Lord spoke to him about it, and he found it a promise to claim for, for the needs of um, all his homes for the people in trouble. Like I said, you had the anchor home for boys there, then you had the lighthouse, and that was, again, 18 to 25. And then they had started, and this was all on the what they called the farm there, Corpus Christi. And then you had the uh, 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 home for uh, men, uh, 25 and older, called the City of Refuge. And they had two homes for ladies, the uh, big one, and, and probably the most Probably the most prominent one of the day uh, of all the homes was the Rebecca home for girls. I think it was the largest in number. And that, that would have um, been the girls that were uh, around the same age as uh, the boys that I work with in the anchor home. And then they had, uh, for uh, older uh, girls that were above um, Rebecca home age, they had uh, the Jubilee home, which they had started. So you had all five homes operating there at that time in 1982. And the burden was great. <clears throat> and the burden was great about that. He was burdened about that. He was also burdened about... Um, the election coming up for the governor because a guy that had given them, had, I think he had been governor before and he was running again and he had given them problems with the homes and he and, and just a lot of troubles. But the Lord spoke to him about that and, and he was very encouraged about the, when the Lord said, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. And that's when I first noticed the verse during that, um, uh, that uh, film. And, and it was actually just that part of the verse <clears throat> that um, he zeroed in on. And that I noticed, and that's when I first was aware that that said that in the Bible. I I, I had read it, um, but I hadn't noticed it. And I think you can understand going through the scriptures. However, once in a while you find something that you don't remember seeing before, even though you've read it. It was there before, uh, but uh, but then you see it. When I saw it, it was an encouragement and exhortation to me. Also, at the time, back then, that's all that I noticed uh, about the verse. As time went on down through the years, I'd, I'd see it more, I'd read the Bible more, pay attention more, and, and I would discover more of the context of that verse. Let's look at the context back in verse number five, starting there. Verse five. What leads up to this and, and, and what's he saying when he says this? Uh, in context, he says, first of all, moreover, Amaziah, Amaziah is the king at this time. He's the king over the kingdom of Judah. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, according to the houses uh, of their fathers throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield. So there's, there's a battle that's about to ensue. And he numbers his valiant men, and, and he's got a lot of them now. Uh, we're talking about the, the kingdom of Judah consisted of those tribes there, Judah and Benjamin, two tribes. The kingdom of Israel consisted of the 10 other tribes. And from the kingdom of Judah, he finds 300,000 choice men that were able to go forth to war. They could handle spear. They could handle um, uh, shield so they could protect themselves and they could also go on the attack. He's got these folks there. 300,000, not just 300,000, you know, draft Flunkies, they're just starting. <laughs> they haven't even really been trained. 300,000 uh, of uh, choice men, if you will. Uh, 300,000, he, he calls them choice men, able to go forth to war. So these folks were, you know, they were formidable. 
And he's gotten, that's a pretty good sized army. I mean, these are, these are young men, ready to go, 20 years old uh, and above. And, he, and he's get these, gets his army together, getting ready to go out against the Edomites. Edomites was a nation from Edom. They came from uh, Esau, who was Israel or Jacob's uh, brother. And so there, there's a battle that's going to take place. So he's got him a pretty good sized army. I mean, look, 300,000 uh, men. Uh, Amaziah's army is a thousand times larger than Gideon's army when Gideon whipped uh, the Midianites with the power of God. Uh, but Amaziah, Amaziah wanted more. He wasn't content and didn't know that they could handle it with those 300,000. He's, he's kind of putting his faith in the, uh, the troops and the numbers instead of the Lord. And, uh, and so what he does here, wanting more, is he looks to Israel for more. And that's what we uh, read about in verse number 6. He hired also 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel for 100 talents of silver. <laughs> so, you know, he can commission his, his folks from Judah to go out and, you know, they can, they can take care of him. But for the armies from um, uh, Israel, I mean, he's going to have to pay a price and they negotiate and they agree for 100 talents of silver and he gets them an additional 100,000 men. Now, again, the, the, we told you about the, the difference in the kingdoms. This, this, these are all Jewish Israelites, but because of their sin, God had divided the kingdom. And now you have, the, by and large, you have the children of Judah. Generally, um, they, they did better than Israel. Um, you'll, you'll, it's from the children of Judah that sometimes you get to read about a king who did that which is right in the uh, sight of the Lord. Matter of fact, Amaziah did. Uh, right, and that was right in the sight of the Lord. Although it tells you in verse number two of the same chapter, not with a perfect heart. Israel tended to be in apostasy with kings like Ahab and his wife Jezebel, and um, and Judah tended to be more in in fellowship with the Lord. Although they had, they had some winners as well that didn't do right in the sight of the Lord, but they had men like uh, David, Solomon when he was right, Hezekiah. Uh, that's uh, that's Judah. So. What he's doing now is he's looking to the nation of Israel who, who not right with the Lord. And so he hires the additional 100,000 men, pays 100,000 or 100 talents rather of silver for their service. And now he's got 400,000 troops, an army of 400,000. Amazon is all set and ready to go. Let's go engage this battle now. And before he went off to war, however, uh, he runs into verse number seven. Look there in 2 Chronicles 25 and verse 7. He's, he's got them all hired up, 300,000 from Judah, 100,000 from Israel, 400,000 altogether. Let's go to battle. And it says in verse number 7, But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of uh, Ephraim. And Messiah is about uh, ready to head out and make a big mistake. But there came a man of God, it says in verse number 7, with a message for him. Hey, thank God uh, for the man of God who move as God moves him to, 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 to make a, an intervention. And that's what he did. Have you ever been about ready to do something stupid when God intervened in your life? About ready to be, make a big mistake when God used a man of God, maybe to say something to stop you in your tracks? Ever been ready to bot, botch things up when there came a man of God to interrupt your plans? Now, God can sometimes use circumstances to do that as well, but sometimes he'll, he'll use uh, a man. When I was at the uh, Roloff Homes there, okay, let me see, that's 1982. I'm trying to remember 1982. But, so I was, um, I was uh, what, 20... 20 when I got there, and uh, and I got there in June, August I turned 21, so I'm I'm right 20, 21 years old at that point, and um, you know, young man, single, eyes open for potential uh, uh, girlfriend slash potentially a wife. The superintendent had had a daughter, a little younger than me, not not much, and so you know, I was I was interested in her. She was interested in me, and we had gone on uh, one or two uh, dates. And one night we, after, um, just before it was like um, lights out in the, in the home, uh, you know, we had permission just to walk around outside, uh, hang out, talk together. And I was, I was ready to take things to the next level by, by just telling her, you know, how I felt. And um, I'm going to say here, 
It doesn't matter always how you feel. <laughs> Feelings can be very deceiving. And he that trusteth in his own heart, the Bible says, uh, is a fool because the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. And, it's, and, and uh, the right relationship, you cannot determine it just by feelings. Feelings can lead you astray. You can have feelings for lots of people, but you're not supposed to marry all of them. <laughs> well, I was just about ready to do that and, you know, make some big uh, statement or proclamation. I think I was trying to get my nerve up to do it. When suddenly there came a, uh, somebody was um, calling for uh, this girl to go inside because she had a phone call. And she went inside, uh, had the phone. It was, it was actually Brother Roloff calling her to talk to her about this other girl that had, had, had come. They're they all trying to help with and wanted to see how she was doing. I can't remember if it was a relative of his or what, but somehow or another he wanted to check on her and uh, totally just kind of broke the whole up the whole atmosphere. She came back and, and I, I just never, never proceeded with that uh, because I had learned the truth about this verse from Brother Olaf. And now um, I was watching as God was kind of using him just indirectly uh, to interrupt my plans and help me to learn how to live this truth because the truth is that God had something else for me and that wasn't her. And um, so God, um, the Lord interrupted me and, and I appreciate the fact that, that he did. Appreciate Brother Olaf for whatever reason, God saying, call her at this time. She did, interrupted the whole thing. And so God, the same, he was the same man of God that showed me the verse to, to show me how to uh, apply that verse of truth in, in, in my own life. So here Amaziah in the passage gets interrupted, and the man of God tells him to lose uh, the army uh, of Israel. And uh, you don't go with them. Don't go with the army of Israel. Get rid of them. Turn them back. But in our text, in verse number seven, the man of God tells Amaziah, um, as I said, he tells him he's not to let that uh, that army go with him, and uh, and the Lord, the reason he tells him is because the Lord wasn't with the army of Israel. And look at it again, verse seven. But there came a man of God, to, came to a man of God, to him saying, "O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim, he's not with them." So, as I said, Israel and Judah, even at that time, they're heading in different directions, spiritually speaking. And for the blessing of God upon the kingdom of Judah, Amaziah, their king, would need to separate himself from the ten tribes of the kingdom of Israel. And after telling him this, the, after the man of God tells um, Amaziah this, he doesn't even wait for response, but he makes what, what really seems to be a strange statement in verse number 8. And he tells him this. Look at verse 8. He tells he just tells him not to go, and then he says, but if thou wilt go, do it. If you're determined you're going to go. Go ahead and do it. Be strong for the battle. Give it your best. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. <laughs> but go ahead, you know, stiff upper lip. Give it your best shot. God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help and to cast down. He says, this is what God wants. Now, you can go ahead and do what you want, but I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. You take them with you, you're going to fall. Go ahead and give it your best. Do your best. Valiant, right? but you're going to fall. And so it was a, a clear statement, a clear warning. And as Amaziah processes all of this, trying to, to make sense of it, the first thing that he wants to know after he's told all that is, what about all the money we already spent to purchase and hire this army of, of, the, of Israel? I mean, Amaziah, Amaziah knew he, he wasn't going to get a refund for that army if he sent him home. It's like, this is a waste of money. And it's a pretty good amount of money. Uh, according to Schofield's note, he, he hired him for 100 talents of silver. According to Schofield's note, one talent of silver uh, equals um, $1,940. And if you multiply that by 100, that's 194000 However, uh, adjusting for inflation, the Schofield um, Bible that I have, the uh, latest copyright on it is 1945. And now, I don't know if they switched the figures from like the original 1909 back in their copyright uh, to 1945, but I'll, I, I figured from the 1945 copyright, I figured maybe they adjusted it and had it right then. It could actually be more, I'm about to tell you. But adjusting for inflation, the figure uh, calculated from, from the value of it, uh, 194000 in 1945 to today, today it'd be worth about three and a quarter million dollars. 
So it's a pretty hefty sum that he shelled out uh, for this, um, uh, hire this, this uh, army of Israel, even if he was king. I mean, even if you got um, a good amount of money, you don't want to just throw away three and a quarter million dollars or something that's, that's effectively worth that back in the day. So the message from the man of God and the context of our point was this, verse number nine. And Amaziah said to the man of God, but what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. If you get rid of what God doesn't want you to have, God will give you more. You do it God's way and he'll bless you for it. And, and that's the context. Don't worry about the hundred talents of silver. The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. And of course, if you go forth and battle um, without the Lord's blessing, you're able to lose much more than that as well. And the lesson is this, whatever God asks you to give up, he's able to give you back much more. You know the reason why God wants you to get uh, sin out of your life? So he can put more and better things in your life. Um, the Lord uh, the Lord cut off all my uh, previous relationships so that uh, one day uh, he could put um, a better wife in, in for me, uh, which was uh, my wife there about 35 years or so, 35 plus years now in Renee. And I, when I say that, that's not to disparage the, uh, the other girls necessarily either. God had somebody better uh, that was a better fit for them than me. And uh, so when God uh, puts his hand on certain things in your life and lets you know that they need to go, you can be sure that he's got better things in store for you. The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. This is what God's able to do. And so we, we're, we're afraid sometimes to just uh, step out by faith and, and part with things that we become uh, used to in our life in, in order to find out the best that God has for us. I mean, you might be clinging to something in your life for dear life. And that thing might be keeping you back from something a thousand times better than, than what God would like to do for you. It might be you're doing things one way and God wants you to do them another way. And you're afraid to do it that way. You, you, can, you could even state a case like a lawyer why you're afraid to do it that way. If you trust in the Lord, you'd be amazed what God would do for you. And the only way to find out, the only way to find out is to uh, let the army of Israel go back to Israel and walk on in faith uh, with the Lord. That's what we need to learn to do, folks. Walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not by sight. And is not God trustworthy of such faith? As some folks are wont to say, you betcha. <laughs> you betcha he's worthy. Amaziah, he's faced with this dilemma, uh, and uh, everything is there hanging in the balance. He's He's got his own troops, the 300,000. He, he's got 100,000 he hired from uh, Israel, feeling a lot better about the battle against the Edomites. And the prophet, uh, or the man of God comes and says, you, you need to take these guys back. Let them go. If you, you go with them, go ahead and fight. But you're going to lose. You're going to lose. And Amaziah's faith with the dilemma. Everything's hanging in the balance. What's he going to do? Let's find out. Verse number 10. Then Amaziah separated them. It makes you, almost makes you want to cheer. Because he almost expected to say, Amaziah went out with the, the, with the uh, Israelite army anyway and got his clock clean. And Amaziah separated them to wit, the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again, wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah and they returned home in anger. Uh, what, what would they be so angry about? Well, they, they wanted a good fight, number one. Uh, but I think number two, in addition to the money they were hired with, you know, they had the potential to get the spoils of war as well and get even more than that. So, so he separates, and, and how did that work out for him? Verse number 11, And Amaziah strengthened himself and led forth his people and went to the valley of salt and smote of the children of Seir 10,000. Everything worked out just fine. Why? Because he did it the way the Lord told him to do it. Amaziah does the right thing, and, and God uh, uh, comes through for him. And he gets the blessing of God and gets the best out of the situation that he could have gotten. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. The Lord can do the same for you. Don't settle for less than God's best. I'm winding down here, but in pro and I really am, not, not Paul Philippian style. <laughs> I'm winding down here, but, but um, uh, Paul, our Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. We have a way of figuring it all out. We know, we know us, we think, I think sometimes we know us better than God knows us. God knows me a lot better than I know myself. We got it all figured out, and we're going to do it this way because of this and because of that, and we can only go so far. And so, and so 
a man's heart devises his way, and I'm going to do it like this. This makes sense to me. But guess what? Isaiah 55 tells us that our thoughts aren't God's thoughts, and God's thoughts aren't our thoughts. And we don't always think the same as him. But um, when, when God thinks one way and we think another way, who do you think knows best? Your heavenly Father knows best. You can be sure of that. So it says, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directed his steps. And that's what Amaziah's heart was doing when he spent all that money and hired the army of Israel. His heart was devising his way. But the Lord was directing his steps with that prophet who came in and intervened. And now it was up to Amaziah as to whether he's going to follow his own heart or whether he's going to follow the Lord's direction. And Amaziah, as we read, uh, thankfully, I'm glad when the story ends this way, Amaziah followed the Lord's direction and got the blessings of God. And um, he let the Lord direct his steps. He, he bristled at first, didn't he? But ultimately, he let the Lord direct his steps. So, so go thou and do likewise. Hey, you can even go thou and do likewise without the bristling, if you like. And just trust that God knows what he's doing because he does. And God is able to do the miraculous, if you will, because the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I'm so thankful for what you've done um, in my life and what you've laid out in the scriptures. And I'm thankful, Lord, for uh, the, the times when, when you intervened and, um, and I followed. I regret the times when I didn't. But I trust, Lord, that you know best. And I, I pray now you take these words and these truths and apply it, Lord, where they need to be applied in each and every heart. And I pray that um, as we leave here tonight and, and even in these next few moments, there would be spiritual growth. If somebody, Lord, uh, surrenders or, or gives over or steps out by faith, or whatever it is that you're uh, putting upon them. And, and I pray you'd help them, Lord, to take their relationship with thee to the next level in regard to these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? We'll keep our heads bowed and eyes closed. Uh, have the music play. Take a little time to pray. Or maybe you want to just come to the altar or pray at your seat. But um, the Lord spoke to your heart. Why don't you talk to him about it? Ask him to do the miraculous. Surrender what needs to be surrendered. And watch what God will do. Two sixty one. Two sixty one. Let me do it a couple times. Please turn to number two sixty one in your song. Two six one. We'll do it twice. Here we go. He's able. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know 
He is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Heal the broken hearted and set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. Cause he's able, he's able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Amen. Have you blessed week.